Today we're going to look at the most important prophecy in all of Scripture, at least I think it is, because it gives us a prophetic timeline that extends all the way to the time when Jesus returns and sets up his long-awaited and promised kingdom. This lesson, called Daniel's 70-week prophecy, is part four in this seven-part series on Bible prophecy. I would strongly encourage you to make a study of this prophecy found in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. To begin, let's look at those scriptures. We're told, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city, which would be Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The streak shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. Beginning in verse 26, And after sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations there shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Now we'll come back to these prophecies later, this one prophecy later, but first let's review something that God did centuries earlier. Let's notice one reason why God, 900 years earlier, had Moses lead the Jews out of Egypt. For we read in Deuteronomy chapter 7, Moses said, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any people. If you were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers. So the reason that God would keep his oath that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was to rescue his people out of Egypt. We read further in the book of Exodus that God sent Moses, and as he went into Egypt, he sent ten plagues upon the people of Egypt because he refused to break his covenant. So let's notice one reason why God, again 900 years earlier, sent Moses. As a result of delivering the people out of Egypt, Moses took the Jews to Mount Sinai. And there he renewed the covenant with blood. We read in uh, Leviticus chapter 25, verses 1 through 4, God said, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. So we see this term Sabbath. And of course, you recall, after God created the heavens and the earth, he rested on that seventh day and called it the Sabbath day. And he would always remind the people of Israel to remember the Sabbath. So, first of all, God wanted the Jews to remember the Sabbath. God wanted the Jews to let the land go through a seven-year cycle. Now, they could plant and harvest crops for six years, but he wanted them to let the land rest every seventh year. God called the seventh year a, a Sabbath year. Secondly, God wanted the Jews to keep all the commandments, not just some of the commandments. Because God said there in Leviticus 26, you shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes, plural, and keep my commandments, plural, 
In other words, he's saying you've got to keep not only the Sabbath, but also the other nine commandments as well. God wanted the Jews to know that he would take care of them if they would let the land rest every seventh year. Again, going back to Leviticus, this time in chapter 25, we read where God said, If you shall say, What shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow, nor gather our increase. Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth uh, fruit for three years. So you can just imagine the Jews thinking, Wow, if we don't plan on that seventh year, how are we going to eat? Where's the food going to come if we can't harvest a crop? No, the Lord was going to bless them with an abundance of crops on that sixth year that would span, uh, span over three years. So obedience would bring a bigger harvest and a year off or a year of vacation. So if the Jews would let the land rest in the seventh year, then their six-year harvest would be enough for, notice this, three years. It would cover the sixth year, the seventh year, and the following year, because when they planted on that first year after the Sabbath, it would take some time before they could harvest that particular crop. So letting the land rest would bring, would mean losing wouldn't mean losing one crop. Three crops in the sixth year actually mean the Jews would gain a crop <laughs> and they would get the seventh year off. Wow, what a blessing, what a benefit. So that sixth crop would be a parallel application to another lesson that the Jews had to learn regarding the manna from heaven. Recall that during the week, the Jews in the wilderness could only gather enough manna for one day. So over those many years, God rained manna down upon the land, and the Jews could go out and gather that manna, and that would serve as their food. But as they would go out and gather that manna, that manna would only last for one day. If they gathered more manna than they needed for one day, that extra manna would just spoil or rot. But on that sixth day, the Jews could gather a two-day supply. Interesting. And that extra manna wouldn't spoil. So if the Jews would let the land rest in the seventh year, God would give them a triple crop in that sixth year. And in the same way, they could gather twice the manna on the sixth day, and by obeying this cycle, they would get a triple crop in the sixth year. So again, obedience would bring other blessings. If the Jews would obey God, he would give them rain, good crops, plenty to eat, peace, security. He would make their enemies afraid of them. He would give them victory in war. He would give them children who would dwell with them. and He would be their God, and they would be his people. But disobedience would be very costly. We're told in Leviticus chapter 26, where the Lord said, And after all this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I will also walk contrary to you in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons. You shall eat the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places. Cut down your incense altars, and cast your carcasses on the lifeless forms of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. I will lay your cities waste, and bring your sanctuaries to desolation, and I will not smell the fragrance of your sweet aromas. And, and, and then, furthermore, and I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which shall dwell therein shall be astonished at it. And I will scatter you among the heathen, and will draw you out of a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths, as long as it lies desolate, and you be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest, and enjoy her Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest." because it did not rest in your Sabbath when you dwelt, that is, upon the land. So, not letting the land rest would cause God to do two things. First of all, he would scatter the Jews among the heathen for not letting the land rest. 
he would put the Jews off the land and make it desolate for as long as they did not let it rest when they dwelt upon it. Secondly, God would chastise the Jews seven times more for their other sins of adultery, lying, killing the prophets, idolatry, and so forth. Before God put the Jews off the land, he would give them chances to repent. But if they refused to repent and let the land rest every seventh year, God would eventually put them off the land one year for every year they didn't let it rest when they were upon the land. Plus, God would still punish them seven times more for breaking the other commandments. So, over time, the Jews, or sorry, over time, the years would accumulate. For instance, if the Jews didn't let the land rest 70 times in 490 years, God would eventually put them off the land 70 years for breaking the commandment regarding the Sabbath. Plus, he would punish them seven times more, or seven times 70, equaling 490 more years for breaking the other commandments. So, in review, here we can do the math. The land was supposed to rest one year out of every seven, two years out of every 14, three years out of every 21, four years out of every 28, or 70 years out of every 490. Now, here's something to keep in mind. When God eventually decided to punish Israel, he would put the Jews off the land for as long as they didn't let it rest. If he put the Jews off the land 70 years, it means that Israel didn't let the land rest 70 times. They stole 70 crops or Sabbaths over the course of 490 years. Plus, it also means that the Jews would be punished seven more times, that is seven times 70, equaling 490 more years for breaking the other nine commandments. Now, what did God not say? God didn't say he would put the Jews off the land forever. God didn't say he would cancel the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God said he'd put the Jews off the land for as long as they didn't let it rest. The Jews would still own the land, they just wouldn't get to live on the land for as long as, it didn't, as they didn't let it rest, and they would be punished seven times more for their other sins. But after all of this, God still wouldn't break his covenant. We read there in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 44 through 45, Yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor shall I abhor them to utterly destroy them and break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. But for their sake, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God, and I am the Lord. In the New Testament, Paul would ask the question, Has God cast away his people? Then he answered, God has not cast away his people. So repentance would bring change. If the Jews would repent and confess their sins, God would remember his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God would restore the nation. He would put the Jews back on the promised land. Now, what happened? Well, Moses died, obviously. God told Joshua to lead the Jews into the promised land and possess it or take ownership of it. The Jews were faithful for a while, but during the time of the judges, they went on a roller coaster of rebellion and repentance, back and forth, that sin cycle, back and forth. At about 1100 BC, sin was just running rampant in the land. The Jews stopped letting the land rest and started planting crops in the Sabbath year. They were also breaking the other commandments, that is, committing adultery, lying, killing the prophets, and worshiping idols, and so forth. In approximately 722, 722 BC, the northern kingdom called Israel was destroyed after several warnings because the people were more wicked than those in Judah. In approximately 606 BC, Jeremiah warned the southern kingdom called Judah that God was going to put them off the land for 70 years. So there in Jeremiah 25 verses 8 through 10, we have these words. Therefore, this says the Lord of hosts. Because you have not heard my words, 
Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, that is Babylon, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, against these nations all around. I will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, a perpetual desolations. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of myrrh and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of millstones and the light of lamps. Now, Jeremiah wrote a book stating that the land would be desolate for 40 years. Yes, the Jews will be put off the land to serve the king of Babylon for 70 years because they haven't been letting the land rest. After 70 years, God would then punish Babylon. So after 70 years, not only did God punish Babylon, but in an amazing way, one night, there in Babylon, there was this amazing handwriting upon the wall as the king of Babylon was celebrating a feast. And, of course, it shocked the king and everyone with him. Jeremiah's prophecy was written in a book for all to read. It's called the book of Jeremiah, and it's in the Bible. The book of Jeremiah was written, notice, before the Babylonian captivity, about 600 years before the birth of Jesus. And so God has preserved the book of Jeremiah so we can read what he told the Jews. Jeremiah's book says the Jews will return after 70 years. Thus says the Lord that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you, and I'll perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. So Israel would be off the land 70 years for stealing 70 crops or Sabbaths. After spending 70 years in Babylon, God would cause the Jews to return to the land. But don't forget that they would still need to suffer seven times more, or 490 more years, for their sins of adultery, lying, killing the prophets, and oh, worshiping idols. Now, we have the historical record of what happened recorded for us in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Yes, the Babylonians did attack, we read, and those that had escaped from the sword, that is the Jews who were not killed, that is the Babylonians carried away to Babylon where they were servants to him that is the king and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. Why? <laughs> to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept her Sabbaths to fulfill those 70 years. So what does the word of God say? Well, the Jews were carried off to Babylon. They were put off the land. The land enjoyed her Sabbaths. The land was desolate for 70 years to recover those 70 Sabbaths that they stole. This was done to fulfill Jeremiah's prophecy about the Sabbaths. Now, we must remember and not forget, the 70 years off the land didn't have anything to do with Israel's punishment for adultery, lying, killing the prophets, worshiping idols, and so forth. The 70 years off the land was punishment because the Jews did not allow the land to rest. The Jews would still have to be punished seven times more, or 490 more years, for their other sins. As we look at all of the commandments, it's not only important to keep the Sabbath, but just keeping the Sabbath is not enough. The Jews needed to keep all of the commandments, not just one. We can be sure that the failure of multitudes to attend church in our day and the removal of the Ten Commandments from public property, from our schools and so forth, will eventually trigger a reaction from God. The Jews reached a point of no return. Yeah, the Jews stole one crop out of seven, two crops out of 14, three crops out of 21, until they had stolen 70 crops out of 490 years. Then God's patience ran out, and God didn't forgive them anymore. Now, it's interesting there seems to be a limit to God's forgiveness. You may recall Peter's conversation with Jesus there in Matthew chapter 18, where Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? He thought that was a good number. Jesus said to him, 
I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven, or four hundred and ninety times. Yes, God is patient, but God will also fulfill his word. Judah's limit was seventy times seven, or four hundred and ninety years. One day, Daniel discovered an important truth. We're told here in Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, In the first year of Darius, the son of Azurias, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in desolations of Jerusalem. Now, we learn from this that it's very important to study Bible prophecy. At the time, Daniel was in Babylon. King Darius of Persia had taken over. Daniel was reading the book of Jeremiah when he understood why the land was desolate for 70 years. The Jews were off the land for 70 years because they stole 70 crops and Sabbaths, and God said he would bring them back into the land. So don't miss this. Daniel said he was reading the book of Jeremiah when he understood why Israel would be off the land for 70 years. Now, this tells me it's very important for us to read the entire counsel of God, including all of Bible prophecy. But Daniel didn't say he understood the part about the seven times more punishment. That comes from the book of Leviticus. Daniel only figured out the part about the Sabbath of the land from the book of Jeremiah. So, an important point being... The church hasn't replaced Israel as some teach today. God did punish Israel, but he didn't break his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, he put the Jews off the land for 70 years for stealing 70 crops, but he did not cancel his covenant. The land is still theirs. A second important point. You have just read some of the same verses of Scripture that Daniel read in Babylon more than 2,500 years ago. If you want to read the entire book of Jeremiah that Daniel read in Babylon, you have it, and you can read it. Now, if Daniel could figure out the part of this prophecy by reading the book of Jeremiah in Babylon, you can too. Daniel got involved. First, Daniel got involved because he understood why Israel was off the land for 70 years. Secondly, Daniel got involved because he knew God forgives and shows mercy. So what did Daniel do? Well, Daniel fasted, prayed, confessed his sin, confessed Israel's sin there in Daniel chapter 9, and he asked God to remember his covenant, reminding God that he is merciful and forgiving, and asked God to let his anger be turned away from Israel. Daniel also asked God to hear and to act and not delay because the city and the people are called by God's name. So what happened while Daniel was praying? He writes further in Daniel chapter 9, Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man or angel Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. So suddenly, this angel Gabriel appears to Daniel. So, Gabriel appears to Daniel to give him, what, skill and understanding. It's clear that Daniel understood why Israel was off the land for 70 years. But Daniel didn't understand that the Jews would be punished seven times more for breaking the other commandments. And we've talked about that, adultery, lying, killing the prophets, and so forth. So, Gabriel's message to Daniel was this. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, the 490 years that is, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, time out to review the meaning of one week, which we see frequently mentioned there in Daniel chapter 9. The Hebrew word week simply means seven, and one week means seven of something. One week of days means seven days. One week of months means seven months. One week of years means seven years. So when the Jews say one week, they can mean a week of days, one week of months, 
one week of years, and so forth. So a week just simply means seven. Now we have terms that we also describe in the numbers. When we say when we use the word dozen, we always refer to twelve, right? And so for the Jews, when they say a week, it just simply means seven. For example, when Jacob wanted to marry Rachel, Laban said to Jacob, Fulfill her week, and we will give you this also for the service which you shall serve with me, yet seven other years. And Jacob did so, and fulfilled her week. And he loved also Rachel more than Leah, and served with him yet seven more years. So we see over and over again this term week meaning seven years. So to fulfill her week meant seven years. So Jacob served Laban one week or seven years so he could marry Rachel. For him, one week meant seven years. That is six years plus a Sabbath year. So the test concerning Jacob. If one week meant seven years to Jacob, how long was seven weeks? Again, we multiply. Seven weeks equals seven times seven or 49 years. So therefore, going back to our prophecy, how long was 62 weeks? 62 weeks times 7 equals 434 years. How long was 70 weeks? 70 weeks times 7 years, 490 years. Your people haven't completed all of their punishment. The Jews had been off the land for about 70 years. But they still needed to be punished for breaking the other nine commandments. Remember, 70 times more? They still needed to suffer 70 weeks or seven times more or 490 more years to finish the transgression. So, now when would the 70 weeks or the 490 more years start? We're told there in Daniel chapter 9 verses 25, Know therefore and understand that from the beginning, that from the, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, let me read that again, now, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, that was the command that would start the time clock. The 490 more years of extra punishment would start with the command to restore and to build Jerusalem. The command was issued by Artaxerxes, and it's found in Nehemiah chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Here is the command to rebuild Jerusalem as recorded there in Nehemiah chapter 2. If it pleases the king, Nehemiah wrote, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city, Jerusalem, of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of God upon me. So here the king gave the command, permitting Nehemiah to go back to Jerusalem and to, the people, to his people Israel. And so that command was given there in Nehemiah chapter 2. Now, the countdown started. When Artaxerxes issued the command to rebuild Jerusalem, the countdown clock on the 70 weeks or 70 weeks of years of Israel's punishment started ticking. And it will take us down to what the Bible calls the tribulation period. Now, the Bible gives us the month and the day that the countdown started. Going back to Nehemiah chapter 2, Nehemiah said the command to rebuild Jerusalem was given in the month of Nisan. That was, that's found in, in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. By Jewish tradition, if Nehemiah didn't identify the day, and he didn't, it was to be the first day of the month. The command to rebuild Jerusalem was given on Nisan 1. But the start year is disputed, as we'll see. Nehemiah said the command to rebuild Jerusalem was given in the month of Nisan in the 20th year of Artaxerxes. We're told there in Nehemiah chapter 2, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, and the king granted them to me according to the good hand of God upon me. Years ago, a man by the name of Sir Robert Anderson researched this prophecy, and he wrote a book called The Coming Prince. He proposed that Artaxerxes issued the command to rebuild Jerusalem on March 5th, 445 B.C. Another individual, Dr. Harold Horner, formerly of Dallas Theological Seminary, is now with the Lord. He wrote a book called The Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ. He also made a study of this prophecy in the timeline. And he proposed that Artaxerxes issued the command 
to rebuild Jerusalem on March 5th, 444 BC. Now, it really doesn't matter which date we look at, because the way the Jewish calendar is set up, this comes out to be the same whether we start in 445 BC or 444 BC. If we just simply start counting one year sooner, we will just end up one year sooner. The number of days between the events will still be the same. So Gabriel foretold the exact day of the first coming of Jesus to the nation of Israel, where he said, Know therefore, Daniel, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, which we've already looked at, until Messiah the Prince, that is Jesus, shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street, shall, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. So here we do the math. Seven weeks plus sixty-two weeks equals equal sixty-nine weeks of years. And going back to, to recall that uh, a week is seven years, so sixty-nine weeks times seven years equals 483 years. Doing further computation, 483 years times 360, which is the number of days in a prophetic calendar, comes out to be 173,880 days. So Gabriel said that there would be 173,880 days from the command to rebuild Jerusalem until the first coming of Jerusalem. So let's look at that prophetic calendar, 360 days per year. We must realize that the dates in Daniel are based upon a prophetic calendar, which is 360 days per year. The Bible uses a 360-day year in Genesis chapter 7, 11 through uh, chapter 8, verse 4, concerning the flood of Noah's day. It's also found at the end of Daniel's book in Daniel chapter 12, and also in the last book of our Bible, there in Revelation chapter 11, chapter 12, and chapter 13. Now, if Sir Robert Anderson is right, and we start counting on Nisan 1 in 445 BC and count off 173, 880 days, this means that Jesus would make his triumphal entry on Nisan 10 in 32 AD, which would come out to be in our Gregorian calendar, April 6, 32 AD. The Passover may, maybe would have been on Thursday, April 10th, once we convert to the Julian calendar that we use today. Dr. Harold Horner is right. If, if Dr. Harold Horner is right and we start on Nisan 1, 444 BC and count off the same number of days, 173,880 days, this means Jesus would make his triumphal entry on Nisan 10 in 33 AD, which would be a Monday, March 30th, 33 AD. The Passover, in this case, would be on Friday, April 3rd, depending on the Julian calendar conversion. Now, the Bible confirms that Jesus made his triumphal entry on Nisan 1, according to John chapter 12, verses 1 and 12, where we read, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who had been dead, from whom he raised from the dead. The next day a great multitude had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So the Bible confirms again that Jesus made his triumphal entry on that first, or sorry, on Nisan 10, according to those verses we just looked at. This was his official appearance to the nation of Israel on that Palm Sunday. So Nisan 10 is a very important day in the Bible, and we'll come back to it. But Gabriel divided those 490 years into three separate time periods. Going back to our prophecy again, we're told, Know therefore and understand, Daniel, that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The streets shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. So this passage mentions three separate time periods. The first period being seven weeks, or seven times seven, or 49 years. The second period being 62 weeks, which is 62 times seven, or 434 years. A period of one week follows, which would be a seven-year period. The total coming out to be 490 years. In the first 49 weeks, Jerusalem was rebuilt. At the end of the 434 years, 
was the first coming of Jesus when he rode triumphantly there in Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday. Now, the last seven years, the still future, is going to involve what we call the tribulation period. So, these three events that Gabriel prophesied in sequence. First, there will be a period of seven weeks of years, or 49 years. Secondly, there will be a period of 62 weeks, or 434 years. Thirdly, after this period of 62 more weeks, for a total of 483 years, the Messiah will appear. Fourthly, after the Messiah appears, he will be cut off, we're told, but not for himself. So what does that mean? Fifth, after Messiah is cut off, the people of the prince shall come and destroy the city of Jerusalem and the sanctuary and the temple. So when the Messiah is cut off, but not for himself, in other words, he died, but not for his own sin, as we know. He died for us. After that, after he is cut off, we're told that the people of the prince shall come and destroy the city, Jerusalem, that is, and the sanctuary, that is, the temple. Well, Rome did this in 70 A.D. Sixthly, at the end of the age will be a flood. It will be overwhelming, but it will be after 70 A.D. Seventh, the prince that shall come, that is, the Antichrist, will sign a covenant or a peace treaty with many for one week or seven years. Eighth, in the middle of that week, that is that last week, the Antichrist will cause the sacrifice and oblation, that is the offerings there in the temple, to cease. Sacrifices were always done in the temple in Jerusalem. But since the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, it will have to be rebuilt before the middle of the tribulation. So we have to be careful. How do we come out with the, with the, the approximate dates? Some say Nero was the Antichrist, and he destroyed Jerusalem in the temple and the temple around 70 A.D. Well, the prophecy, prophecy does not say that the Antichrist will destroy Jerusalem and the temple. It says the people, notice, the people of the prince that shall come. The people of the Antichrist, not the Antichrist, but the people of the Antichrist will destroy Jerusalem and the temple. Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by the Romans in 70 A.D. Now, who are the people of the prince that shall come, that is, of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is still future. He didn't show up in 70 AD. He's still future. He will show up at the end of the age, and he will sign a covenant with many for seven years of peace in the Middle East. Let's notice what Jesus said when he made his triumphal entry on Nisan 10. He said to the people, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. But now, they are hidden from your eyes. In other words, you are blinded. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, and surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Furthermore, he said, you should have known that this was the day that your Messiah would appear. Well, like the Jews, there are so many today who are not watching for the signs, which are just coming at us in every direction, that the Scriptures tells us will accompany in these last days. Again, he said, but you didn't know, so now you're blinded, and Israel and Jerusalem will be destroyed again. The Jews were blinded and destroyed because they didn't know what day their Messiah would appear. They watched the weather, and they could predict the weather, but they ignored the Old Testament prophecy, and that we're told about that in Matthew chapter 16. What about that covenant? Israel and Jerusalem would be destroyed. The Jews would be blinded and put off the land a second time. But God's everlasting covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob wasn't canceled. The land is still theirs. This is why Israel's return is so vitally important. It's setting the stage for the last seven years that we call the tribulation period. Remember, I said that Nisan 10 is very important. <laughs> Artaxerxes gave Nehemiah the command to rebuild Jerusalem there in Nehemiah chapter 2. 
Seven weeks plus 62 weeks later, which was 483 years or 173,880 days later, Jesus made his triumphal entry on the exact day the angel Gabriel said Messiah would appear. And that day was Nisan 10. So why is Nisan 10 so important? Well, Nisan 10 is significant because God told Moses to have every family of Jews, while they were still in Egypt, select their Passover lamb, and on that particular day of Nisan 10, according to Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. So Jesus made his triumphal entry on Nisan 10, which is the same day every family of Jews selected a lamb to sacrifice as their family Passover lamb. Nisan 10 is also the same day that the priest selected the lamb to be sacrificed as a nation's Passover lamb. Now we need to notice that there are two lambs. The first lamb was sacrificed at home by every family and by the head of the family. So each family observed Passover with a Passover meal at home. The second lamb was sacrificed at the temple by the priest. And so the nation observed Passover with a Passover sacrifice at the temple. This involved two services, one at home and one a little later at the temple. Now, the nation's lamb was killed at evening time of Nisan 14. God said to Moses, Select the lamb on Nisan 10, but you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. The priest killed the nation's Passover lamb at the temple at evening time, five days after they selected it. Now, Jewish families, you have to understand the time clocks that Jewish people used. It went from sundown to sundown. So evening is 3 to 6 p.m. in Israel. Jewish families killed their Passover lamb at 3 p.m. on the day before Passover so they could cook it and have it ready to eat for their Passover meal at 6 p.m., which would be the beginning of Passover day for Jewish time. Jewish priests killed the Passover lamb for the nation at the temple at 3 p.m. the next afternoon, which was still Passover. Jesus was crucified on Passover day, according to Matthew 26, verse 2. Jesus died at the ninth hour, which would be three o'clock in the afternoon. Jesus died on the exact day, at the exact time, the priests killed the nation's Passover lamb at the temple. So this is all a shadow of good things to come, according to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. God told the Jews not to leave any of the Passover lamb until the next day. Well, the body of Jesus was removed from the cross before the next day. God told the Jews not to break any of the Passover lamb's bones. None of the bones of Jesus was broken. So Jesus was the Lamb of God who died on Passover day for the sins of the world. There in John chapter 1 verse 29. The angel Gabriel told Daniel the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. Remember our prophecy in Daniel 9 26? Paul said, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, but not for himself, but for us. Now, the Antichrist will come from a revived Roman Empire, and Jesus foretold of this coming of the Antichrist. He said there in John chapter 5, verse 43, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Now we have the identity of many. Well, we're told, and he, the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, as Gabriel told Daniel. Now, the Bible doesn't identify the many. Currently, there are many entities wanting to establish a peace treaty with Israel and their surrounding enemies. For instance, the U.S., many of the Arab states, and so forth. Regarding animal sacrifices, we're told back in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, and in the middle of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. So the Antichrist will stop the animal sacrifices in the middle of the tribulation period. Before the Antichrist can stop the animal sacrifices, they have to be restarted. So let's look at the temple and the priest. 
The animal sacrifices were always performed by the priest at the temple there in Jerusalem. So, the temple and priest must come back into existence, and animal sacrifices must start before the middle of the tribulation period. The priests have come back into existence, believe it or not, and some are already slaying a Passover lamb, as we see from this picture. So things that had to happen for these prophecies to be true are happening. The Jews had to be captured and taken to Babylon for exactly 70 years, and they were. The Jews had to return to Israel after 70 years, and they did. Someone had to issue a command for Jerusalem to be rebuilt, and Artaxerxes did. The temple in Daniel's time had to be rebuilt. It was completed about 516 B.C. Jerusalem had to be rebuilt, and it was rebuilt by 396 B.C. Jesus had to appear exactly 173, 880 days after the command to rebuild Jerusalem, and he did. More fulfilled prophecy. Jesus had to be killed, and he was. The temple had to be destroyed, and the Romans did that in 70 A.D. Jerusalem had to be destroyed, and the Romans burned it when they burned the temple in 70 A.D. Israel had to become a nation again to sign a seven-year covenant, and it became a nation on May 14, 1948. Additionally, Europe had to reunite so the Antichrist can rise there and sign a seven-year covenant, and Europe has once again, come back to life and united. There has to be peace negotiations. If there's going to be a 70-year covenant, these are ongoing and world leaders want a peace treaty. Peace treaty. Jerusalem has to be rebuilt, and it has. The temple has to be rebuilt, and most of the design work is now done and ready. The animal sacrifices have to resume, and priests have already resumed uh, some of those sacrifices. So we have all of this going on, and we read about it, we hear about it everywhere. In fact, the Jewish Sanhedrin, which was the, governor, the Jewish governing body, has already come back to life again from, from being absent for 1,600 years. And so we see now the evidence of so many things coming into place. For instance, the Jews feel it's very important to come up with a red heifer that is absolutely perfect. And uh, so they're now looking at some red heifers that they have, watching very carefully and making sure that they're completely red. The showbread, which is also part of the temple uh, ministry, is being baked for the first time in four, 1940 years. In Old Testament times on the Sabbath, the priests placed showbread in the temple as an offering to God. When the Romans destroyed Israel in 70 AD, the recipe and baking process was lost. Recently, after intensive research, a group of priests, engineers, and archaeologists succeeded in baking showbread. Also, a school has been built by the Sanhedrin at Mizpah and Jericho to train priests. 30,000 priests so far have been trained. Also, garments have been made for the priests who will serve there at the temple. Priests have been trained to offer animal sacrifices, and most of all the temple items have been made. So far, millions of dollars have been spent in putting all these items together, including the great altar of sacrifice, which has been built. The Sanhedrin authorized priests to start construction on the great altar of sacrifice at their school. It is now complete and will soon be used to resume animal sacrifices. In fact, it is portable and can be moved to the Temple Mount once they get government permission to rebuild the temple. Priests, the priests are lighting the menorah and the incense in the temple reenactment now. They're, in other words, they're rehearsing for this future uh, reinstitution of the temple sacrifices. As we conclude, our next lesson is called The Case for the Rapture. The Case for the Rapture. I hope you can study along with us. God bless you.